Will we run out of food, energy or breathable air before the ice caps melt? Or will we find a path to a sustainable planet? This was the challenge facing this year's climate summit in New York. Global leaders were compelled to consider the environmental, economic and political cost of feeding 9 billion people in 35 years time. How can we feed all our citizens without destroying our planet's basic resources? I believe in the words of Dr. King that there is such a thing as being too late. For the sake of future generations, our generation must move toward a global compact to confront a changing climate while we still can. Accelerated climate change is here right now. This body, perhaps more than any other gathering in human history, now faces this difficult but achievable task. You can make history or you will be vilified by it. Well, the key outcome from New York is that climbing is back in the high political agenda of international leaders. More than 120 head of state and government gather in New York and the big emitters like the US, China and a few others pledge that they will pick their emissions and they will reduce their emissions substantially. There was no real pressure for countries to come forward with ambitious pledges to reduce emissions, unfortunately. That's something which still has to happen, which will happen early next year, we think. One of the bigger commitments is looking at a fund to help those parts of the globe which need assistance to move forward. So I think that will be a serious first step. The second thing, again, is looking at bringing everyone to the table. Rather than just having some sort of open-ended commitments, this time we need to actually have not just the target, but the delivery. How will you meet this target, and how will we know when you've done so? Otherwise, frankly, we don't really know what's happening on the ground, and that's why we've got to make sure that there's enforcement as well as encouragement. Governments are faced with a kind of environmental obesity. Our consumption has grown so much that every part of our life is affected. Health, mobility, life expectancy. The Climate Summit was an attempt to detox our future. But did it do enough? Lo que veo desde dentro es un poco la misma visión que tienen los ciudadanos desde fuera y es la falta de compromisos estables, obligatorios, con resultados. They didn't uh, do anything big uh, during the summit itself. Uh, but at least now it's on their agenda. They know that they have to take a position over the next year. And the second good thing is that there were citizens in the streets, especially in New York. So the American, uh, basically, also media coverage was huge. And uh, our problem is US, maybe even more than China. Climate change problem is a problem which was created by us Europeans, by the Americans, by the Japanese, by all those who were already rich some years or decades ago. And it is penalizing heavily those who are poorest in the world. So if you are the Prime Minister of India, of Bangladesh, of any African country, what you will say, and I think there's good reasons to say it, is why should we move as long as you don't move? We all know and we all recognize that climate change is a global problem. That's why we can't just solve it here at home. It can only be solved across the globe. And we've got to be very careful that some countries are not using this as a means of gaining a competitive advantage that would be the beginning of a very serious problem at a global level. If you look at the moment, China is opening up one coal-fired power station a week. We've got to make sure that the commitment we make and deliver against is measured against the commitment and delivery of other parts of the globe. They benefited a lot, unfortunately, from not implementing environmental and climate um, engagements uh, needed to rescue the world. Uh, but I think even today, or moreover today, um, in, in China, public opinion is changing as well, eh? if you see to the big cities and the fact that people don't have clean air. China is really threatened as a continent by climate change uh, because they have hot seas around them and their drinking water is, is already today scarce. We know what it is to fight um, when it goes to our interest with regard to oil and, and, and other energy sources, um, gas, eh? but um, in the future it will be water and it will be nutrition and food. Uh, um, if we do not tackle uh, the climate issues in a, in a good way, it will affect peace in the world as well. We should be very much aware of that. As we approach an era where wars will be fought over water as well as oil, global governments are slowly adjusting to sustainability. Not because they want to, but because the 21st century's insatiable consumption society is slowly self-destructing.
Dimas no espera a que nosotros tomemos decisiones políticas y acordemos con las empresas y con los lobbies de la industria. En muchos casos hay contradicciones entre los intereses de los ciudadanos y del planeta y el negocio, eh, especialmente el que tiene que ver con, con el de la generación de energía fósiles. The real thorny issue is how do you break down a greenhouse gas target among the member states. We will see how that plays out. So there is always a certain amount of negotiation and wrangling from the countries who are saying that they will find it very difficult to meet targets which have been allocated to them. In practice, they tend to overstate the difficulty of doing so. Right now, we've done a great deal here in Europe. We're on target to meet our commitments, which is great. But the rest of the world isn't on target to meet those commitments. And in truth, we've done so at some cost to our own industry. And we're trying to compete, and if we're not on a level playing field, then frankly, we're going to struggle. No hay una intención clara de cambiar de modelo. Continúan estando sobre la mesa los intereses geoestratégicos de mantener un modelo de energía de larga distancia con canalizaciones enormes que tienen un efecto, un impacto sobre el planeta que son fuertes. Sometimes, when you are an energy person, you get a bit nervous when these foreign policy persons start to discuss about energy. What is European diplomacy now doing? They are saying, oh. Um, Iraq is difficult, Russia is difficult. By the way, Iran has gas. And they will completely forget about that we have a big dispute on Iran over the, their nuclear uh, pro-weapons program, just to say, well, let's go to Iran. I, I'm stunned when I see the lack of understanding of these foreign policy makers. And uh, definitely, I think, if they want to be serious, what we can do in Europe is upgrading efficiency. No. Uh, upgrading renewables, no. Upgrading our, our interconnections, no. That's, that's, we, we are the drivers, we can decide on that. This is not about just telling people to change their light bulbs or to buy a hybrid car. This disaster has grown beyond the choices that individuals make. This is now about our industries and our governments around the world taking decisive, large-scale action. China is now the number one investor worldwide in wind and in solar. So not only the biggest producer of solar, but also the biggest user of solar and or investor uh, in solar in, in, in China itself. Um, they have had this huge air pollution uh, problems, so which now the, the Communist Party who is ruling is really afraid that that could trigger also democratic uprise. So uh, the Chinese government is moving faster than all other governments, uh, I think, in this very moment, relatively. The Commission has set serious targets, and those targets have begun to change the culture, and that is important. The real test as we go up now is to make sure that we are not doing so at a cost to ourselves, to our industries, and to our business. The last thing we want right now is for what we would call carbon leakage, for the companies that employ so many people here simply to go to other parts of the globe where the standards are lower. We think the carbon leakage case has been drastically overstated, and I think to give you just one example, DG Climate Action, Hedegaard's unit, when it, they looked into to try and find real examples of carbon leakage, they declared a blank. They simply could not find evidence. Europe is still facing an economic crisis. So how can we add more costs to businesses, energy charges, carbon taxes in various forms? How can Europe talk about a sustainable environment if its businesses can function in a global economy? Is higher unemployment an acceptable price for sustainable environments? I sincerely believe um, that there is no contradiction in that. Um, the future of Europe will lie within green growth. You only need to look around and, uh, and see uh, the potential that energy savings, for example, can have in the, in the European economy, or what's going on in Russia or in the Ukraine. Don't European leaders want a more energy efficient economy and uh, less imports? Money invested here in Europe, in our own infrastructure, in our own economy, well, that creates jobs here, that boosts growth here in Europe. If you want to combine the, the goals of energy independence but also of climate, then the solution is 100% or 90% renewable energy by 2050. That's the way to go. Whatever Europe does, it simply has to go for much, much higher shares of renewables 
and to reduce its energy consumption. We have to plant new models of transport, of circuits of short production, of favoring local agriculture, which is also rich in the generation of jobs. The facts are very compelling and uh, the figures are also very compelling and you can see that the most competitive economies in Europe are the countries that are the more energy efficient and more resource efficient. In the end, it may be science which triumphs. The scale of our environmental challenge is so great that it is probably beyond a political and economic solution, which leaves us with innovation. Investing in science and groundbreaking research is perhaps our best hope of finding new energy sources, harvesting sufficient water supplies, and feeding a massively growing population. And science, not politics, may be our best shot at avoiding military conflict. The Climate Summit may have done its best, but it didn't do enough.